The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. We may have thought that a new year would bring some relief, but COVID-19 is not done with us yet. Still, even as we face new variants and vaccine shortages, we've learned more to help in the fight. Tonight, we're scanning for potential game changers to get past this pandemic. Then, our Ontario hubs take another look at municipal amalgamation in Sudbury and from how rural Ontario has confronted COVID-19 to what movie theaters have planned for our post-lockdown entertainment, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, it's Friday, January 29th, and that's ahead on the Agenda. Even as daily case numbers improved this week, Ontario hit a grim milestone. More than 6,000 people have died from COVID-19 as the second wave's toll outpaced the first wave. But as new modeling showed, there is hope, and much of it comes from our experience and the incredible work of public health and medical science. With us for the latest in Mississauga, Ontario, Dr. Zane Chagla, Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University and an infectious disease specialist at St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton. And in North York at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, microbiologist and infectious diseases physician, Dr. Samira Mubareka and Dr. Isaac Bogosh, infectious diseases physician at the University Health Network and a scientist based out of U of T and Toronto General Hospital, where we find him today. Hello to all of you. Thank you so much for making time for us. We know that your schedules are so busy, so thank you for being here. My pleasure. Uh, so what a year it's been. Um, we find we find that we have a vaccine, a few vaccines, and mm -hmm. we think that we are at the finish line. And then now we find out that there are different variants of COVID-19. Uh, Sheldon, if you could please bring up this board. Uh, the UK variant, also known as B117, the South African variant, or 1.351, the Brazilian variant, or P1, and one more you may not have heard about the California variant or Cal 20C. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mubarak, uh, what do we know about the California variant? Well, we know the least amount about this particular variant because it hasn't been around or it hasn't been identified and characterized as much as the variants that were originally detected in South Africa and in the UK in particular. And also the Brazilian variant is probably one of the newer ones on the scene. So some of the data that's available now, we know um, around transmissibility, for example, for the uh, variant detected in the UK initially, because it's been around longer, initially detected in, in September, um, and subsequently has spread and become dominant um, in the UK. And that was a, a, a clear signal early to mid-December that something was going on, and that's when the UK um, you know, shared the data that they had and very quickly made it known that uh, this was a variant of concern. So initially they were called variants of interest. Mm -hmm. Now they're variants of concern. And most of the concern is attributable to the fact that they likely almost certainly have enhanced transmissibility. So this is established for the UK variant and also the one originally detected in South Africa. Less data around the uh, ones detected in Brazil and in uh, California, but we anticipate potentially similar phenotypes. Um, and uh, Dr. Mubarak mentioned the UK variant, Dr. Bogash. Um, should we be surprised that the virus is mutating? No, not at all. We know that's what viruses do, and, and it's completely expected. Uh, in fact, uh, as Dr. Mubarak mentioned, there are these variants of concern that were discovered in these countries. But if there was the capacity to do the special test, that's called the genomic sequencing, all over the world, you would find variants of concern popping up likely everywhere. As the virus mutates, it's, it's going to change with time. And it's interesting that, uh, and I know Dr. Mubarak could probably speak to this better than most of us on the panel, there is a certain pattern that we're seeing of these mutations that are happening in dis distant countries independently of each other, but to the same part of the virus. What is and, that pattern? Uh, you know, this is something... 
Sorry? Yeah, there certainly is. I mean, you look at the part of the virus where the mutations are happening that are changing how this virus spreads. It's a part of the virus called the spike protein, and the spike protein is an essential part of the virus that really helps it attach and get into our cells and infect us. So it's kind of interesting that this is happening. Uh, it, it really is no surprise. Uh, in fact, if people who, uh, like Dr. Mabaraka and Dr. Chagala and, call, and, and myself and many others who have commented on this have been talking about these mutations that were very likely going to happen ages and ages ago because that's what viruses do. How many, do we know how many of uh, the UK v uh, variant we have in Ontario right now, Dr. Borgash? Um, it is being counted, but I would say that it is an undercount. So currently, I think the official numbers are in the 40s, but it's likely way higher because of a recent outbreak, for example, at a, at a uh, long-term care facility near Barrie. And quite frankly, we are seeing evidence of community transmission of this variant. So there's what's detected, uh, and then there's what's actually happening on the ground. And what's detected is probably a small percentage of what's happening on the ground. It's not entirely clear what the delta is going to be between detected and, and, and actual, but it's here. It's certainly here. And, and here's one thing. I know that it is likely more transmissible. I think people are sort of debating to what extent it's more transmissible, but I think it's pretty much agreed upon that it is more transmissible. But here's the, here's the other part of the story is that, yes, it is more transmissible, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible to stop. So if you look at the United Kingdom, for example, they had this huge spike in cases uh, just before Christmas time. And, this, and, and, and like their healthcare system was getting overwhelmed. Um, but uh, they took conventional control measures, uh, you know, were able to lock down, were able to basically limit the number of contacts people were, ha were going to have in a day. And you watch those cases plummet. So it's not like this has to take over and has to overwhelm our healthcare system. We already have the tools to keep this at bay. Well, I think that gives people a little bit of hope. Um, and I want to um, follow up with something that you just said about the trans, um, why it's transmissible. Dr. Chekla, um, what mutated in this new variant to make it so much more transmissible than SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, so again, these are mutations within the original SARS-CoV-2 strain, uh, and these are functionally within the spike protein. So a single amino acid or a single building block of those proteins seem to have swapped in a position. Uh, we hear about 501, which is the major mutation that's been noted in, uh, in B117. There are some theories about biologic plausibility of why this is more contagious. There are some preliminary studies looking at things like viral load in people, especially in the respiratory tract when they're infected by this mutant. And so, yes, it's not necessarily more transmissible, but the person who has it has more virus. There are also some studies looking at re um, uh, receptor adherence. So when the virus actually hits you from an exposure, does it bind to the respiratory tract at a, a higher affinity than before? So the actual transmission, the events that lead to me infecting you are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, the, the, either the, the source is a higher infectious load or again, the virus adheres to you more. And again, these things get important in the sense that, you know, where we are today if I have an exposure, there are many things that still protect me along the way from getting COVID. We know in household studies, it's 15 to 20 percent of people that get COVID, even if they're exposed at a high risk. And that has things to do with viral load, how well the virus adheres to your respiratory tract, uh, the amount of virus in the environment. Um, those buffers start coming down more and more and more as we talk about these variants. So the transmission is the same. But those events that lead to one having a negative result after exposure that uh, protect one are starting to become less and less and less apparent and more people will get a positive result after an exposure. Well, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that it is more deadly. Is it, Dr. Chagla? So this is based on some of the initial modeling data of death. And so the, these are four different consensus groups that took a look at this. Um, they really did take a look at people that died kind of within the December, January period. It's important to know less than 10% of their deaths from COVID-19 uh, were uh, uh, variants type. So they, they really had a small pool of people they were making these assumptions on. Uh, the other part is, you know, we're still not sure if there are people that are overrepresented in these death studies. And we can think about what's happening across the country. The people that are more represented in death right now are those in long-term care. 
Uh, and so if B117 were to get into a care facility, you would overrepresent death in that care facility as there would be larger number of deaths. And so this is emerging data. It's very, very preliminary. It's based on a small data set. There is some data suggesting that the model show increased death and 30% higher. Again, you know, contextualizing it, it would be 10 of 1,000 versus 13 of 1,000, so not a significant rise. Mm -hmm. But again, th these models may have some issues in terms of how they're interpreting this data. And as things start playing out more and more around the world, I think we'll get a better estimate of whether or not this is more fatal or just overrepresented in certain populations. And Dr. Mubarak, I think when people hear about all these new variants that are coming up, um, you know, we just found out we have a few vaccines to choose from and now these variants. Mm -hmm. How do these new variants affect the vaccines that we have right now? Yeah, so we're learning a lot more about that. There are a couple of approaches that one could take to try and understand what, if any, impact on vaccine efficacy these variants may have. And it's important to highlight that not all of these variants have the same mutations in the spike protein, though there's a lot of overlap, particularly around between the one that was first identified in South Africa and the Brazilian uh, variant, especially. The UK variant has a 501 change, but not the 484 change. So there may be differences. So that's one thing to highlight. And of course, there'll be differences among people. I mean, one reassuring point is that when we mount an immune response to a vaccine, we don't just make one type of antibody. We make you know, a, a repertoire, a number of different antibodies that, that, uh, that span the spike protein um, on antigenic sites. So even if there is reduced efficacy, it's not going to go from you know, the original 95% or 90% to zero. There'll be potentially a range there and still most likely, hopefully, there'd be enough antibody for protection. Um, but really we need to understand that from an experimental perspective, but also there's some data that's that's come out fairly recently from a clinical trial just, just yesterday. It's a press release, so I don't want to overstate it. I, I don't think that uh, the data has been submitted in full as a preprint, but they are seeing some differences between uh, vaccine efficacy. This is from the UK and from, from South Africa as well. And the same vaccine seemed to have uh, different efficacy between those two populations probably based on some of the biological uh, determinants of the of the variants because again there are three changes in the receptor binding domain of the in the South African variant versus um, the the UK variant but even within that different individuals even with the same viral infection will have a range of responses. So the bottom line is, um, number one, ideally we should be testing these vaccines against these variants. Unfortunately, that's not as difficult to do as it was several months ago because now these some of these variants have, are dominant in, in, um, in the UK and South Africa respectively. So it's, it's actually not so much of a, a challenge. But also, I know vaccine companies are already thinking, like Moderna, for example, about generating boosters. That's the benefit of the technology that's being used, is that it's a little bit more plug and play, mm -hmm. making it sound far simpler than it is, but you can replace that spike uh, protein or mRNA, depending on what kind of uh, vaccine that you've made. So there is some some leeway that the technology allows and some some agility there, but uh, we need to continue to do the surveillance for these variants, and we also need to continue to do the studies to understand to what degree efficacy could be compromised. And I'm guessing, too, that um, just to go off what uh, you said earlier, uh, Dr. Borgash, that there are probably more variants uh, that we don't know of. Um, the ones that we do know about, um, what is it that we must know about each variant? Well, I think the key thing here is that with the variant discovered in the UK, the, the issue really is transmissibility. Because so far to date, it looks like all of the vaccines that have been developed still provide some decent protection against that variant. But of course, if it is more transmissible and you have community spread, it will ultimately cause significant harm because at the end of the day, it's going to infect more people, which will result in more hospitalizations, more ICU stays, and more deaths. So community control efforts are key, but also vaccination is key. That's a common theme because if you look at the other variants of concern, for example, the ones that we know about, uh, like the one that was discovered in South Africa and the one that was discovered in Brazil, the, the issues with those 
primarily are surrounding immune escape. And then one of the questions is, are the vaccines going to be as effective against those variants, the current vaccines? Well, over the last 48 hours, we now have data on two additional vaccines, the Novavax and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This is incredible stuff. I mean, like the, the pace of scientific discovery is just mind boggling. Like it is, we, we are, we're cruising along here. And, and what's interesting is these vaccines don't seem to provide the same level of uh, protection against the variant discovered in South Africa. And initially you think, okay, that's problematic because it is problematic. You want to have a uh, high, high levels of protection. But when you scratch the surface, and again, uh, like Dr. Mubarak, I've got to be very careful because a lot of this data is preliminary and it's press release data and we're not, we don't have the full data set. But when you sort of scratch under the surface, you start to see that it appears that these vaccines are actually, even though people might get the infection, they appear that they will protect against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And at the end of the day, like, those are kind of the metrics that matter the most, right? Like, look at what was uh, tearing Canada apart and other parts of the world apart. Healthcare systems were getting stretched beyond capacity. Long-term care facilities were on fire. People, we have over 19,000 deaths in, in Canada, you know, and, and we saw what happened, for example, in Northern Italy, Wuhan, New York, uh, Houston, other places where their healthcare systems were just getting, getting destroyed. If you can turn a disease that is very, very severe in elderly populations and, and turn it into something much, much, much less severe, uh, mitigate the morbidity, uh, mitigate the hospitalizations, mitigate the mortality, we'll have done something very, very good. So on the one hand, yeah, sure, we, we'd love to if these vaccines were more effective against these variants of concerns, that's obvious. But I don't think we should just completely ignore them. They will provide significant benefit. And, of course, with the technology that we have now with the mRNA vaccines, it's plug and play. You, they're already starting to make new mRNA vaccines that will be more effective against these variants. You don't likely need to do that. repeat those phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, which took about a year, actually just under a year to do, which is remarkable in, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You can likely just modify the vaccine, much like we modify the seasonal influenza vaccine, and mass produce them way faster than you can produce uh, other conventional vaccines because they're mRNA vaccines. And it's likely that at some point, you know, maybe in a year, maybe a little later, maybe a little sooner, we might need a booster vaccine. So, like, it's sometimes in the media, a lot of this is being portrayed as doom and gloom, and the long-term forecast is doom and gloom. I'd like to just separate the politics, separate the ideology, and just look at the data, look at the science. And if you just look at the data and look at the science, it actually paints a decent picture for the spring and, and, the, and the summer in Canada, even when you account for the variants of concern. So, I mean, the key, the key point here now, pardon me for blabbing on and on, but the key points here now are continue to keep the infection controlled in the community and can continue to get those cases in a downward trajectory and then vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. If we can do those two things, we'll be okay. Um, and it sounds like what you're saying, and honestly, uh, it's we're we're uh, so lucky to be able to learn from all three of you. Um, it sounds as if what you're saying too, it's uh, it's buying us time. Um, and Dr. Chagla, you know, we've been hearing stories of people uh, being reinfected. Have we seen uh, many cases of people getting COVID more than once? Yeah, there, there aren't a ton of cases, but they have been well described and well characterized in a different spectrum of illnesses. Uh, the initial case was a traveler who had had COVID that was mild uh, and, and uh, was going into another airport region where he had to be retested. Uh, it was asymptomatic at the time, but when they do sequencing, much like we're doing sequencing for these VOCs, um, uh, we see that there's a significant difference between the two uh, uh, strains that the person had. Uh, and so really did prove that. There have been hundreds of case reports around the world uh, of reinfection. There's a, a, a spectrum of illness, some of it milder, but some of it can be more severe, particularly in areas of the world uh, where there is significant severity. There was a concern here uh, about one of the variants, particularly in Manaus, which is still not proven by any means, but is emerging in a population that had a significant amount of pre-existing immunity based on seroprevalent samples and may be an example of um, reinfection, although very, very sketchy data right now.
Um, but there are good studies coming out looking prospectively at people that are in healthcare settings uh, that have been infected. And we still know that the rate of getting COVID again being reinfected is relatively low. And in some studies, it actually approaches what we see with these vaccines at three to six months, where you have nearly 95% of individuals who are serially sampled uh, that don't have COVID. It's somewhere between 80 to 95% on the better studies that have been done to date. Uh, so there certainly is reinfection, but there certainly is protection from natural infection. It is not a reason why not to get vaccinated, though, as we know these vaccines can essentially manipulate our immune systems in a way that is much more controlled, aggressive, and sustainable than a natural infection, uh, and as well knowing what natural reinfection may look like. Uh, and so, you know, the recommendation is still that individuals who have been infected to consider getting vaccinated, they can certainly delay it a little bit knowing that they have pre-existing immunity, uh, but, uh, but having vaccines available to these individuals still helps with their chance at reinfection in the future. Um, I want to go back to what uh, Dr. Bogash was saying about um, everything that's happened this past year has just kind of been uh, a blur. I read somewhere, and I wish I'd written down the quote, uh, but a scientist had said that uh, in the past 10 years, science has been able to achieve what would have taken 11 years. Uh, so, Dr. Mubaraka, um, from the little that you knew, I guess, 10, year, uh, 10 months ago, it feels like years, doesn't it? Uh, 10 months ago, um, how has the treatment of COVID patients changed to today? Well, just before I answer that, I, I, I do have to say we're, we're now referring to COVID time. So five weeks in COVID time is maybe <laughs> five months in flu time and maybe five years in terms of time for, for, for other fields. It's, it's, it's amazing thinking about what's happened with these variants and, and looking back when we initially were alerted, it was five or six weeks ago and look at how much has come of that. But but similarly for, for therapeutics, and there have been a couple of approaches for therapeutics. I think out of necessity and not surprisingly, the first thing that people reach for are, are the known agents. So looking at repurposing agents that are already available and have been tested and are known to be safe in humans, that, but potentially that are used for something else. Um, the other is to maybe look at some agents that are fairly well along in their development, but maybe not in common practice. Uh, remdesivir would be one good example of that. That that was a drug that was you know, developed for other viruses, but of course it made sense. And there was some great work uh, by Matthias Gauthier and others who showed that it could work for, for, for um, SARS-2. So I think that it's that has been another sort of approach. And then there's the completely different first first in class approach that people are looking at now. But of course, the range on that is much, much longer. And I'm, I'm focusing on therapeutics here. We've already talked about vaccines, but there are also other things that have really progressed significantly. Simple things, what seem like simple things, like how you position a patient in their bed, whether they're, they're prone or not, um, you know, oxygen administration, use of high flow versus intubating people early, all of these, so a lot of the supportive uh, modalities that we use for these patients has really evolved at a rapid, rapid pace over the course of the last 10 months. And I anticipate we'll continue to do so. Um, and things will be, will be, you know, brought on that had initially been discounted. Um, you know, if I recall early on, we were saying don't treat people with steroids. And now people who sit fit certain criteria are getting dexamethasone. So also part of it is understanding the disease. You know, initially people were thinking, is this like influenza? It was clearly not like MERS or SARS-1 in, in many respects. But is this going to look more like influenza? What, what is this actually going to look like in terms of what we'll call disease phenotype? What kind of complications are patients going to get? You know, so are there interventions that could be um, um, targeted against those complications rather than the virus itself. So I'm talking about immunopathology and thrombosis or clotting and things like that. We didn't know what what the natural disease would be for a long time and very grateful for some of the early uh, clinical series, case series that came out of China, very reliant on uh, the jurisdictions who were first fighting this virus to share that data so that you know the therapeutics and the other interventions could follow. And Dr. Chagla, um, the Montreal Heart Institute has reported success working with another drug, I hope I pronounced this right, uh, Colchicine. Um, what do you know about this medication? And how do you, how do you pronounce it? 
the uh, colchicine. So <laughs> it, it is a very old medication. It works at reducing inflammation through a number of pathways. And as Dr. Mubarak had, had mentioned, you know, uh, COVID is very unique in the sense that uh, it is as part of an infectious disease, but also a part of an inflammatory disease. And many therapies have been dedicated to saying, okay, the virus will get taken care of, but the inflammation that the body deals with to try to deal with the virus from one's own immune system might be causing more damage than good and maybe what's mediating people to actually get hospitalized or die. And so colchicine is, is a really novel drug in the sense that it's a inflammatory agent that you can actually take at home without necessarily needing an IV, which is where some of the other drugs have been trialed. And so it could be theoretically given very early to individuals in their disease to tamper that inflammation to prevent them from getting into hospitals. And so the Montreal Heart Institute randomized 4,000 individuals to colchicine versus placebo. They were actually quite unique. They were able to get people within 24 hours of diagnosis uh, and getting the drug to them uh, four hours after being enrolled in the trial, which you know I, I can imagine was a very difficult job knowing this could be in the middle of the night. Um, patients took the dose for about a month um, and uh, looking at the entire data set, there were very few individuals that ended up uh, uh, dying or needing mechanical ventilation, although there was a small difference in those individuals. It's still not clear if that's significant enough or just uh, the, the statistical spread. Uh, but when you look at people that were hospitalized, they were hospitalized slightly less uh, when they got colchicine versus uh, uh, getting the placebo. Now, it's not a huge difference, but it's one of our first drugs that can look like it prevents hospitalization amongst a number of individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, the number needed to treat to prevent one hospitalization is about 70 cases. Um, and so it is certainly promising, recognizing that colchicine has side effects about, uh, you know, COVID gives you diarrhea, but about 10% more people had diarrhea on top of uh, uh, COVID in this trial. There are a significant number of drug interactions associated with colchicine, and these were excluded from the trial. And so when rolling this out into reality, there may be a few select patients where this may work after they're diagnosed with COVID-19, not before, as this has no antiviral effects, um, but it has to be balanced in individual discussion based on their ability to tolerate side effects, their ability to tolerate the medication, and their ability to not have drug-drug interactions with other things that they need for their other baseline health. Uh, we only have about five minutes uh, because it's been a great conversation. And I want to get in a few more questions. Um, Dr. Bogash, you sit on the Provincial Vaccination Advisory Board. And this week, uh, we learned the government misreported the number of people who have been vaccinated. How can that happen? So what they did was they looked at, the, so actually that's not entirely accurate. The number of vaccines that have gone into arms was correct. The number of people that had received both doses of the vaccine was not correct. And then it was corrected. But uh, yeah, clearly that's a problem. I mean, you always have to present the, the, the correct data. And of course you need public trust in, in any public health program. And and this was a you know data reporting error that has since it's been a big corrected. error though don't you uh, think? I mean I think it is a, a problem right because everyone's I was going to say everyone's watching but even if nobody's watching you shouldn't have those errors you shouldn't have those errors. I think it's also like I don't think it impacted um, you know distribution plans like this was really a more of a front facing issue rather than a rear uh, you know back end issue. But it's still an issue. You've got to present the right data in a meaningful manner. Uh, so, yeah, luckily it was uh, identified and corrected quickly. The other data on that website, though, you know, they talked about number of people that had a first dose, number of doses that had been administered. That was all correct. It was that they double counted the people that had received a second dose. Yeah, not ideal. Certainly not ideal. You've got to instill confidence in your vaccine program and present the accurate data. Uh, but, you know, identified, corrected. Let's move along. Um, I, I don't want to labor on this point for too long, but, you know, I think people have been waiting for vaccines as being that game changer. And um, 
I, uh, we've seen the anti-vaxxing um, demonstrations. Uh, maybe COVID fatigue is happening. Um, there are no vaccines coming in this week. Uh, people seem to be losing patience with the rollout. And it's not just provincially, but I think it's also federally, to be fair. Um, are mistakes being made? Uh, you know, we rely on foreign companies in different countries to produce and send us vaccines. Full stop. I mean, we need access to the vaccines. You can't have vaccine rollout programs in your provinces without access to vaccines. I still think the federal government uh, was did a great job in betting on which vaccines we would have access to. Uh, because remember, these decisions were made months ago before we had any phase three clinical trial results, and they really picked winners. They, they truly picked winners. They, they bet on winning horses because at the end of the day, the vaccines that they bet on ended up being successful in their phase three clinical trials. We have you know, Moderna, we've got Pfizer, we have contracts with Johnson & Johnson, we have contracts with Novavax. Like, these all appear to be very, very helpful. Okay, that's step one. Step two is now we've got to get them in the country which, uh, you know, is, is clearly in, in the context of an insatiable global demand is, is proving to be challenging. The program started in mid-December. If we were having this conversation, let's say, three months ago, people were talking about starting the vaccine programs in the first quarter of 2021. When the government tells me first quarter of 2021, I interpret that as March, but I, I don't know how you guys interpret it. So, but, but it needles started going into arms December 14th. So, yes. It would be great to have more access to vaccines. Yes, it would be great to expand these programs and speed things up. Yes, we should be doing everything we can to get as many vaccines in the country and once they're in the country in as many arms as possible as fast as we can. We absolutely should. Of course, I'm concerned about supply chain issues. Of course, I'm concerned about uh, protectionism and vaccine na uh, nationalism and, and, and our, our supply chain. But at the end of the day, we still have access to vaccines. They're still going in arms. And the limited vaccines that we have mm -hmm. are going into the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, like into long-term care. And, and that's, you know, that's 70 percent of the deaths that we're seeing in the country. So, yeah, of course it can be better. But I think we're making do with what we've got and using it in a very meaningful manner. We have one more minute. And uh, speaking of in the country, Dr. Mubaraka, there's uh, news that a Canadian vaccine has started in human trials. How much stock do you put into that? Well, I mean, any kind of vaccine or therapeutic development that happens domestically, particularly if it's followed up with domestic manufacturing capacity, is exciting. Obviously, it's just, it's phase one. We'll have to see what, you know, hopefully beyond, it'll go beyond that and we'll see what phase two and three show. Um, it'll be challenging because now, instead of being tested against placebo, they'll have to be tested against another vaccine, uh, presumably. So so it's, it, it is, uh, it, it's not going to be easy or straightforward necessarily. But having said that, I think anything that enhances domestic capacity is, is good news. In the meantime, we'll continue to max up, uh, put our masks on, like Dr. Fauci said, maybe two masks. Uh, I wish we had more time. We had 10 more questions to ask you, but I know you have your busy schedules to go back to, and we do appreciate all of your insights. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Twenty years ago, Sudbury was one of a number of Ontario cities that the provincial government opted to restructure, merging several smaller entities into one big one. It was hotly debated then, and even now is still somewhat contentious. Nick Dunn covers the northeastern part of the province for Ontario Hubs, and he joins us now from Sudbury to explain. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jay Ann. Now, just before we get started, so that we are all on the same page, have a look at this. What is municipal amalgamation? Amalgamation is the merger of a set of municipalities or municipal councils into one single tier municipality. That new municipality is governed by a single council that offers shared local and regional services such as transit and garbage. There are benefits and drawbacks to amalgamation. Generally, it's understood that it makes for more efficient, less costly governments. But while amalgamation may cut down on the duplication of services, it also reduces local decision-making capacity. Ontario went through its largest period of amalgamation in the 1990s, when then-Premier Mike Harris reduced the number of municipalities from 850 to 444 as part of his common-sense revolution. 
There are 173 single-tier municipalities in Ontario. Now, Nick, the city of Greater Sudbury comprises of quite a large area. Uh, can you describe what that merger entailed? Yeah, so uh, seven municipalities were merged together, Jan. Uh, we had Sudbury, Nickel Centre, Valley East, Capriol, Rayside Balfour, Onaping Falls, and Walden. And these were brought all together under the city of Greater Sudbury, which is now 3,228 square kilometres. And to put that in perspective, that's larger than the city of Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Calgary combined for just about an area of about 160,000 people. So it's quite a large municipality and it's very dispersed in terms of its uh, population concentration. So let's talk about the rationale. Uh, why create a megacity? Well, as uh, our amalgamation explainer uh, says, uh, the rationale under the common sense revolution was to have fewer politicians and save money uh, under the Harris government. Um, the idea is that you don't have six head librarians anymore, six CAOs, so you're cutting costs at a staffing level. But, uh, you know, if you were to look at the reality of it, uh, oftentimes uh, it service levels had to go up. They had to harmonize with the rest of the municipality. Um, you know, garbage collection had to be the same across the board and staffing levels. Uh, you know, if a librarian in Sudbury is getting paid $60,000 a year on average, while uh, someone in Walden was getting paid $40,000, they would be raising the salary to 60,000 as opposed to lowering everyone else's salary to 40,000. So all in all, uh, that on top of the downloading of municipal services, we haven't really seen those kind of cost cutting measures but that was the rationale uh, in the 1990s. Now, your article for TVO.org looks at a number of things, one of those things being the challenges uh, with the amalgamation itself. Uh, what have some of those been? Well, Jay, and when you have such a large municipality, um, you know, you're, you're looking at Ward 2 alone is about 797 square kilometers. Uh, it's a huge, huge area. Um, so you're, you're, you're looking at all these incredibly different interests and uh, values, right? Uh, so someone in uh, Onaping Falls, for example, doesn't really want their taxpayer dollar going to a downtown development, right? Uh, likewise, people kind of in the inner city aren't necessarily interested in garbage collection in Rayside Balfour, right? Um, so it's very difficult to manage those interests within your ward. Uh, J Jeff McCausland, uh, counselor for Ward 4, was telling me that, you know, he has the hipster enclaves of uh, Kathleen Street in the Donovan all the way to 100-year-old family farms and, you know, suburban areas like Azilda. So even managing, you know, your constituents as a counselor can be difficult, let alone as a mayor of the city. I imagine, you know, there are groups of hipsters and groups of farmers who are, you know, praising amalgamation. Have there been any successes to note? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, you can look at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine as uh, something that was, uh, you know, it was a real regional effort to bring that together, not just for the city of Sudbury, but all of Northern Ontario. But it, the amalgamation certainly helped in getting that moved forward. Uh, you can also look at uh, post Walkerton, um, the, the, the water treatment plants uh, and the whole set of regulations that came about that. Um, you know, towns like Onaping Falls and Levac had uh, their water treatment treatment run by mining companies. Uh, that's something that a lot of people don't realize in Northern Ontario. You know, at one point, you know, in the mid 20th century, going even up to like fairly recently, you know, the, the mining companies owned uh, property or houses rather, and uh, people would be renting from them. They were running the water treatment until uh, post Walkerton when it became a little too expensive and the city had to take on those expenses. So, you know, you can look at the, that kind of infrastructure and, um, you know, you can look at that regional kind of uh, effort to provide these services as a bit of a success uh, within the, the scope of Greater Sudbury. Now, we mentioned off the top, it's been 20 years um, since amalgamation in Sudbury. There's always going to be people who are going to be for it and against it. Uh, has that been the case in Sudbury? Yeah, well, going back to uh, Councillor McCausland, he was telling me about some of his uh, constituents when he was, uh, you know, going door to door in Rayside Balfour. He described them as physically shaking uh, and just in anger. Uh, about amalgamation, there was a real sense that uh, these towns, which were largely independent from the city, you know, you didn't have to go to Sudbury to get uh, 
groceries, for example, in Rayside Balfour or a place like Whitefish. Um, so there was a real sense that the identity of a town was robbed. And that's even come forward on council. Ward 2 councillor Michael Vagnini has put forward motions before to consider de-amalgamation. Uh, these haven't really gone forward in a major way. Um, you know, they, they haven't ever been pushed through. Uh, I think the consensus is that amalgamation, despite the cost savings not occurring, have been beneficial, especially in Northern Ontario. Um, it's always been the case that uh, Northern Ontario struggles to get what it needs from the province and even the, the federal government. So in creating a larger entity called Sudbury, there's greater power there to lobby for funding, lobby for grants, uh, and other pieces of infrastructure, because this is how Northern Ontario has always had to kind of uh, survive. Uh, we've this area has always felt like it's been neglected infrastructurally, socially, uh, while generating so much revenue from mining that created uh, Bay Street uh, and what it is today. So ultimately, you know, even though the kind of on paper reasons for amalgamation didn't really come through, I think a lot of people feel that it's been uh, an essential part of uh, Sudbury's survival in the north. Nick Dunn, I want to thank you so much. And I wouldn't be surprised if we talk about amalgamation in, say, another 10 or 20 years from now. <laughs> It'll always be contentious. <laughs> thank you again so much. That's Nick Dunn, our Northeastern Ontario Hub journalist. The agenda this week got word from rural Ontario on how their communities have responded in this pandemic and assessed how movie theaters might bounce back after the lockdowns. The Agenda's Week in Review begins hearing from farmers on how they've persevered to keep the food supply strong. When it comes to farming, how would you describe the events of the past 10 months and what they've done to you? To say that the challenges that our farming community faced would be an understatement. Um, wh whether it was coming down to, the big thing was labor and the uncertainty of whether we were gonna have our labor in time for early spring planting. That was that was a big deal. So um, I know I only have 30 seconds. So I would say um, labor challenges and um, yeah, at the very beginning, because this was all new to all of us. Rob, what would you add to that? Uh, I would suggest that we felt a lot of uncertainty and a lot of volatility in our market. And uh, as proactively as we tried to approach this when the pandemic was announced in March, it just seemed we were faced with one obstacle after the other and, and a lot of supply chain issues, both on our end and in our input end. Mike, over to you. I, I think I'd echo what, what the people uh, have already said. Just like the rest of us, farmers are people too, just like the rest of us, there was a, there was a certain amount of variability in the impact uh, that, that was felt on the farm, depending on specifically what you were producing. And Sylvain? Well, generally, uh, beyond labor, uh, I think uh, labor the labor issues were heavily uh, publicized. Uh, the one thing that that stood up to me is is processing. The processing sector across the country was not ready for COVID, and farmers paid for it. Uh, there were huge disruptions, whether it's in livestock or in horticulture. Uh, it was very difficult for our farmers to cope with the with the shocks coming from processing. Mike, let's follow up on the issue of food security, because when this pandemic started, I guess a lot of people had some reasonable questions about whether or not the food chain, the food supply, processing, the whole nine yards, whether it could keep up and whether our supermarket shelves would continue to be stocked. What have you noticed over the past 10 months on that front? Well, I think what we learned was that, that our food system is incredibly robust and resilient, notwithstanding some of the issues that, that Sylvain raised with the processing sector and that Evia raised relative to labor. We saw some disruption. Uh, we saw significant pain, I think, at the, at the producer level when those beef processing plants closed. Uh, th those were an issue, particularly for producers, much less for consumers because we have this integrated supply chain. So in terms of food availability, we did really well. I think what that does though, is masks the significant food security impact that COVID has had, not in terms of availability, but in terms of all of the people who've lost work, who've seen income go down and became food insecure because they couldn't afford food 
and not because they couldn't find food. Right. Let's let's uh, carry on on that regard because Sylvain, you led a team that basically looked at the pricing situation you have over a number of years. You got the 2021 edition of Canada's food price report just out, and we want to take a look at some of what you are forecasting for the coming year. Canadians, you say, can expect to see an overall food price increase of 3 to 5 percent for the year 2021. The most significant increases are predicted for both meat and vegetables, and that gets you up 4.5 to 6.5 percent over last year. The annual food expenditure is estimated to be almost $700 higher, that's 5% higher, this year for, let's say, the average family of four. And that is the highest forecasted increase since the start of this report more than a decade ago. So, Van, just get us behind those numbers a little bit. How did you come to them? Well, I mean, we, we do work with three other universities for this report, including Guelph, uh, the University of Saskatchewan, and UBC in Vancouver. And we run different models, and uh, our models were telling us uh, a very, very dim story for this year for bakery, meat, and, and, and vegetables, unfortunately. Now, for Ontario specifically, uh, the forecast is more around 3%, but keep in mind, Steve, that the general inflation rate is very low. So 3% uh, will will be will appear to be very high for people with tight budgets. I mean, food affordability is an issue across the country, including Ontario, unfortunately. I want to give people a better sense about what COVID-19 has meant to much smaller places. Now, yours is an island of, I don't know what, 5,000 permanent residents or something like that. Uh, has COVID-19 been much of a factor at all over the past year? Oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, like like the rest of, uh, I guess, the world and communities across Ontario, uh, uh, people are, uh, are are struggling. They're fearful of uh, what this means. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, mental health uh, issues for people that are particularly living in vulnerable situations. So... Um, uh, I guess we've, we, we've had to adapt and learn, but uh, one of the biggest things that's happened is uh, on the island itself, we have uh, nine municipalities and uh, seven First Nations, uh, and, and uh, we often uh, didn't have a real sense of what the impact of uh, uh, the, each community's uh, reaction to the pandemic has been. So we've... Uh, We've, we've formed a collaborative group where we meet with uh, all those parties on a weekly basis and uh, we try and give a, an update on what's happening to each other and uh, we've really learned a lot about the island even though we've been here for many years most of us so it's been uh, I think a good thing it's helped us to come together in a lot of ways. Okay Mayor Isbester what's the COVID-19 situation been like over the past year in your neck of the woods? Well, it certainly had a great effect on our small business community, which uh, we do have a combination of rural and urban, but a very vibrant downtown, sort of mom and pop sort of stores, but we also have in our outer limits, uh, the big box stores. And it's been very, very tough on our small ones to see the, um, the large ones be able to stay open. And, and it's just a constant, you know, when and how and is it safe? I think, too, um, for any small community, and I'm sure that the other mayors will, will certainly agree with me, is our people don't sit and listen to any of the politicians at noon on news. They reach out. We get the phone calls. When does this end? Where can I go? Can I go for a walk? So so it's it's good for that. But a, a good thing that's come out of, out of it is the collaboration between our health services, uh, the municipality, and the people, the faith-based, uh, getting uh, food and so on out. So there has been a great collaboration. We just seem to be able to snap our fingers and everybody's there to help, of course, socially distance, physically distance, and they have their masks on. But, but that has been a good thing. Our small businesses are suffering the most and that has to end. Councillor Redden, how about in your part of the province? Well, similar to Mark's, we've uh, got uh, three small communities, Campbellford being the largest. So it's had a great impact on our downtown, uh, initially with the closing of all of our stores and our services. But um, we had a great volunteer effort come together to help serve those that were in their homes without family support. Um, everyone has done their best. Um, everyone's wearing masks. We're distancing. We're doing everything we should. But um, it's, it's either 
either um, there's no real in between. Either the businesses are able to service and uh, do curbside and provide uh, um, everything that, that that individuals are looking for, or they're having to close down, go home, and um, fear that they won't be op able to open again. It's uh, it's uh, a, a tough time for a small community, and um, we're doing our best. All right, Dr. Young, what is your biggest public health concern in your neck of the woods? So, Al, uh, Collingwood is not quite as rural as many of the communities that would call themselves mm -hmm. rural in Canada. And, and I would really speak to the, the, the immense uh, health care workers in rural communities are paper thin and very fragile. And so taking one of those out of a community can have a very large impact on their ability to offer care. For example, some communities might have just two x-ray techs. And so if one gets sick, then that one x-ray tech is on 24 seven for their community all the time. If you have a physician who is one of five physicians in a community that looks after all those roles and is sick, and not able to work for a couple of weeks, then then the the, the burden is super high. A obstetrics nurse who is out could close down the obstetric services of a community. So the 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 need to protect communities that are so fragile from the infection is really is really acute. And I I, I uh, so that's yeah. So I would say that the next wave of our of our priorities would be to make sure that even though there isn't high prevalence in many of these communities, uh, the the fragility of that community's healthcare sector is so high that vaccination for that those the healthcare communities for those healthcare workers is really a, a very very high priority to protect those communities and the healthcare workers within it. How bleak does it look right now? Uh, it's as bleak as the bleakest horror movie you could imagine. But um, I think that, uh, you know, interestingly enough, the executives of some of the major firms, they're, they're treating it more like a thriller. They're hoping that they'll come out at the end and, you know, Harrison Ford will save the world. Like, for example, El Ellis Jacob of Cineplex, I've read an interview with him. He's very bullish on what's going to happen once the vaccines are, are widely available. He thinks people will return to theaters. And Adam Aaron of AMC, they managed to stave off bankruptcy last week with a big cash infusion. And he's optimistic for the rest of the year, so uh, it, it's hard to argue with that. Alexandra, tell us what you've been doing at the Regent Theatre over the past 10 months. Well, we closed, like all the other theatres, in March of last year, but since then we've been really very busy. We, like many other organizations, have pivoted. Uh, in our case, we have equipped ourselves to live stream. We are not only a cinema, but we're also a live music venue, and, and so we can now live stream our performances. Uh, with or without an audience. And so that's something that we've been focusing a lot on recently. We've also run a major fundraising campaign to get us through this and to um, improve the accessibility of our theater, moving more towards creating a cinema a cinema experience, um, because I think when we come back from this um, COVID time, the new normal will be an audience that desires a different experience that they can't get at home. It's more than just the content they're seeing on the big screen. It's got to be the whole experience that comes with it. And so we're working hard to get ahead of that and to make our theater, um, both in terms of our, um, our physical auditorium as well as our bar and concession more uh, of an experience for our audience. Dan, what's been going on at the Royal for the last 10 months? Uh, basically the same thing as the region. We've been closed since March to the public. We have taken this opportunity to uh, start renovating the theater, the plaster, the paint, all that sort of thing has been uh, worked on and it's really looking beautiful. Um, we are as well pivoting to a kind of a live streaming format with uh, 4K remote cameras, uh, we have all new LED lighting, so hopefully we'll be able, uh, like the Regent, to stream uh, live performances, whether it be concerts or, uh, or um, um, a theater, live theater, that sort of thing. Uh, in our business model, when we acquired the Royal 15 years ago, we incorporated a post-production facility within the venue as well. So the large stage, the large theater, we can actually use as a mixing theater and have been since then, uh, albeit uh, movie independent film has been drastically reduced since March. Uh, it is starting to come back now and we're seeing signs of bookings for, for that type of uh, work.
April, can you tell us now, given that you won't be able to release this on the silver screen as you had hoped, your movie Wander, what's the plan now to get mm -hmm. it out in front of people's eyeballs? So it's been released on all on-demand platforms and digital platforms, North American wide. And to stand out in a very, you know, very busy platform, you have to make your mark. So we had a lot of press, a lot of lead up. People like Peter Howell, critics really matter. Rotten Tomatoes matters more than ever. You know, Twitter, Instagram, all the social aspects to sort of get the word of mouth and the buzz going is all we have. So you really have to try to implement new and innovative ways to get your film to stand out on a, on a new platform without the visuals, like, you know, heading into the subway and you see the poster of Wander that really makes an impact. So how do you stand out in a very, very busy screen world is the next challenge. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, January 29th, 2021. Next week, we'll assess how collaboration around the Great Lakes could shift with a new U.S. administration and hear from former Liberal MP Selena Caesar Chavan on finding her voice and leaving politics. Also, we'll have the second installment of the Democracy Agenda, a joint initiative between TVO and the Toronto Star. I'm Nam Kiwanuga. Thank you for watching TVO. For joining us online at TVO.org, have a terrific weekend. And Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.